<laughs> All right, I believe we are live again here uh, on Facebook on the Mountain Studies Institute page for the uh, third and final evening of our Forest and Fire Learning Series. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. We, uh, we're really excited and really looking forward to the, uh, to the presentations and the conversations that we're going to be having this evening. So uh, we hope that all of you joining us this evening are staying healthy and uh, staying happy out there right now. My name is Emily Swindell and I work with the forest team uh, with Mountain Studies Institute. And uh, tonight, as always, we want to say thank you for your patience as we continue to improve upon our digital presentation skills as we are in some form or another scientists, not necessarily social media gurus. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump in and give you a brief background to the Forest and Fire Learning Series. So in 2018, as the Four Corners area, along with much of the Southwest, was entering into a period of exceptional drought, Mountain Studies Institute, along with several local partners, um, decided to start this three-part forest and fire learning series in order to spark community engagement and awareness about the current state of our forests and how we as a community can address challenges facing our forests, our natural resources, and our communities. So as I mentioned last week, um, it is important at times like these to remember that ecosystems continue functioning without regard to what we're all experiencing right now and our current crisis. Um, and that we have to be aware of what's happening in the environments in which we live, um, which has meant for Southwest Colorado, where we are wide fluctuations in precipitation and shifts in spring and summer temperatures. Um, and this has been going on the last several years here. And so it's important to be very aware and cognizant of those changes in our environment. Um, if not, you know, more important right now at this time uh, as we are staying socially and physically distant um, from one another. So this learning series is really meant to be an ongoing conversation between uh, the public, between city and emergency planners, land managers, academics and researchers about what's going on in our forests and how we may continue to cultivate resilience in our communities, even in a time of physical and social distancing. Um, so actually right here, wanted to go ahead and thank our sponsors for making this event possible. Um, we're very fortunate to have a lot of sponsors for this event um, that include Wildfire Adapted Partnership, San Juan Citizens Alliance, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, Garden Sports Outdoors, Durango Outdoor Exchange, Four Corners uh, here, River Sports here in Durango, Colorado, Maria's Bookshop, Colorado State Forest Service, the Powerhouse Science Center, which is where this event would have taken place if we would have been able to do that, um, Ska Brewing, San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership, the 232 Cohesive Strategy Partnership, and the Dolores Watershed Resilient Forest Collaborative. Um, and we want to give a special thanks again to Four Corners River Sports and Ska Brewing here in Durango, Colorado for donating the items for tonight's free giveaway, which are going to be two single day kayak, canoe, or stand up paddle boarding rentals. And two cases, that's eight six packs of Skagua from Ska Brewing. So thank you so much uh, to Four Corners River Sports and Ska Brewing for donating those for our free giveaway this evening. In order to be eligible for tonight's giveaway, uh, you must be 18 years of age or older. You must like or follow Mountain Studies Institute on our Facebook page, and you must fill out the survey that will be pinned to the comment section of, uh, of this conversation, of this Facebook Live event. Um, and then we will announce 
a randomly selected winner on our Facebook page tomorrow, uh, April 16th. And then we will allow you one week uh, or until Wednesday, April 23rd to respond to the post in order to claim your prizes. So uh, we also wanna say that whether or not you would like to win these super cool prizes, we ask that you please take about two minutes to fill out the survey that will be pinned to the comment section, uh, which will help us provide more relevant information to you in the future for this event. And uh, so we really appreciate you taking a tiny bit of time to uh, help us with that, so thanks. Okay, so on to tonight's program. Um, we're going to have two sets of amazing speakers this, each, uh, this evening, each presenting about 20 or 30 minutes of their experience and their, um, their research and their background and what they're working on right now. Um, and then after each presentation, we're going to open it up to questions, which you can type in the comment section of this Facebook Live feed. Um, so uh, don't feel like you actually have to wait until the very end of the, um, of, of the presenter's presentation. Um, if, you, if they say something and you think of a question, you can go ahead and put that in the comment section. My colleague Dana Hayward will be rocking the Facebook side of this event to make it go a lot smoother. And she'll be relaying your questions to our speakers. Um, so whenever you think of a question, go ahead and pop it in there. Um, and uh, so Dana can go ahead and get that queued up for our speakers. And speaking of our speakers, let's go ahead and introduce our uh, first guest for the evening, uh, Dr. Chad. Ooh, that's our moving forward. This is the event that we're having tonight. Uh, Dr. Chad Koistra um, is going to be our first speaker. And Chad, grew up in Michigan and moved to Colorado in 2002 to study at Colorado State University. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Parks and Protected Area Management from CSU in 2005. He applied his degree over the next few years working for NGOs and state and federal land management agencies on many different habitat restoration, fire mitigation and trail projects, as well as social science research projects across public lands in Colorado and Nevada. He then earned his master of science degree in 2011 from the University of Idaho, where he used surveys and interviews to study people's attitudes about forest management after pine beetle outbreaks in Grand County, Colorado. He earned his PhD from Oregon State University in 2016, where his research focused on understanding people's perception of post wildfire landscape recovery and the implications for forest and wildfire management. His postdoctoral work at Oregon State University, University of Oregon, and Great Basin Institute focused on human dimensions or social aspects of various natural resource issues, including wildfire management, collaborative land management, recreation management on public lands, and residents' attitudes about tourism. He's excited to be back at CSU and working with Dr. Courtney Schultz in her public lands policy group as the wildfire management research program lead. His social science research at CSU with the PLPG looks at one, the factors that influence the effectiveness of different wildfire risk management tools, two, collaborative cross-boundary approaches to restoration under the Forest Service shared stewardship strategy, and three, other issues and policies being implemented by land managers and communities across the U.S. to address forest management issues across landscapes and different landowners. So uh, from here, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Dr. Chad Koistra. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. And let me just share my screen here. All right. Thanks again, Emily and uh, and Dana and and everybody at the Mountain Studies Institute for 
putting this uh, learning series together in this in this really important event um, to, to have these conversations, I, I think is really important. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to join and, and be a part of this conversation. Uh, I do also want to just thank uh, everybody listening tonight. And I know I've enjoyed listening to the, the last few uh, speakers in the last two events the, the past couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm excited to, to touch on those a little bit. And, and I think the things that I'm going to talk about today really build on um, what we've been talking about and hearing over the past couple of weeks. Um, so uh, today I'm going to focus on um, my research and interest in uh, really looking at how people perceive post-fire landscape recovery and uh, what the implications of, of that is for future forest management and wildfire management. So I'm just going to start off with a very brief overview of fire ecology and um, post-fire landscape recovery. Um, and then talk a little bit about social implications of post-fire landscape recovery and, and um, why that matters for forest and fire management. And then I'm gonna spend most of my time today talking about uh, some of my research and other research about people's perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery. Then we'll talk about uh, briefly some ideas for some next steps and kind of where I see um, this type of research fitting into to the bigger picture of, of forest and, and wildfire management. So I know Mike and, and some others have, have covered this topic in, in more detail and I'll just kind of give a very brief overview and I will state that I'm, I'm not a fire ecologist, uh, but I have a general understanding of these issues. And uh, as I, I think of a lot of us are aware uh, past, you know, a, a century of, of fire suppression and decreased logging and, and other management activities, as well as uh, different changes in, in climate, like warmer temperatures, changes in precipitation, um, have led to longer fire seasons, more wildfires, uh, fires in areas where there weren't fires before, uh, more intense fire behavior, and more severe fire impacts in a lot of different landscapes. Uh, the, and then the, the post-fire landscape recovery uh, trajectory is also affected by a lot of those similar um, kind of managerial, ecological, and climatological factors. And uh, when I use that phrase, post-fire landscape recovery, uh, it's typically used to, to describe the ecological and biophysical changes after, after a disturbance, such as a wildfire. So things like vegetation composition, forest structure, soil properties, uh, water flow, you know, new, uh, and other nutrient and hydrological um, properties and uh, keeping track of how those things change after a fire, often in relation to uh, how those conditions functioned or looked uh, prior to the disturbance or the fire in this case. And that's something that I think this combination of past management and, and climate changes have really led to uh, us seeing recovery trajectories that are really increasingly novel and outside the historical range of variability. So really what that means is we're seeing um, changes after these fires that we haven't necessarily seen before. Um, and an example of that is, you know, we're seeing sometimes uh, ecosystems transitioning from forest to non-forest, you know, going from a forest to a grassland um, and other changes like that. So pretty significant changes are happening in some places. And, um, it, and, and those are influenced by a lot of different things. Uh, the recovery trajectory is influenced by uh, precipitation, seed sources, uh, soil properties, slope, uh, management actions like planting and seeding after a fire. Um, and then burn severity is, it has a big influence too. You know, just characteristics of the fire really impact what the post-fire landscape looks like. 
And from a, a, a social side of things, uh, as you can imagine, there's certainly social aspects of, of the post-fire uh, landscape as well. And the big one is that obviously fires change the landscapes that, that we value, that people value and, um, and care about. And, you know, landscapes have a lot of meanings to, to us. They, they mean different things to different people. We value different things about those landscapes, whether it's how we use them um, for recreation or for livelihoods um, uh, or, you know, just meanings that they have, memories that we have of past experiences in those landscapes or symbolic meanings of those landscapes. Um, so obviously changes to that landscape um, can affect people in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways. People react to change landscapes in different ways too. We see people rebuilding or not rebuilding after a fire if they lost a home in, um, in a burned landscape. Uh, we see a lot of changes to recreation behavior sometimes in landscapes. Um, some studies have found changed patterns and um, like more, more day use hiking and less overnight hiking, more um, horseback riding and less hiking in some areas. And um, typically another thing is that people, research has shown that um, post-fire landscape recovery is really important to how um, people feel about different management actions um, especially after a fire or even mitigation actions. For example, people per, uh, a study found a while ago that people prefer uh, prescribed burning if they know that um, if there were to be a wildfire in that landscape after the prescribed burn, if the impacts, um, if the landscape would recover more quickly, if there was a prescribed fire before that wildfire, then there's more support for that um, prescribed fire activity than there would be if um, it was expected to be, you know, a really long recovery time after that. So uh, certainly affects our attitudes, you know, if, if people support different planting and seeding um, strategies after fires, largely to influence the recovery process or um, erosion control measures, you, you know, it, it, it really affects how we, um, how we feel about future management. So I'll, I'll kind of go into that in a little bit more detail. And it's kind of an overview um, for now. So I, today, um, like I said, I, I think a, a good portion of my presentation today will focus on two studies that uh, we completed uh, several years ago, one in 2013 and one in 2014. One was a survey with residents ac across 25 different communities and then one was more of an in-depth case study in Montana um, with residents to talk to them about a, a recent wildfire event they had experienced. So for the first study that I'm gonna talk about, uh, we call this the 25 fire study. It was, we used a, a survey, a male survey to quantitatively explore the factors that predict perceptions of landscape recovery or perceptions of landscape recovery after wildfires. So I'll, I'll just give a quick overview. Uh, we used some uh, a large set of spatial data and analysis processes to select 25 different wildfires that occurred in either 2011 or 2013 uh, in the Northwestern United States. So Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. And uh, we picked fires that were at least a thousand acres in size. So they were fairly relatively substantial. Uh, they ranged anywhere from a thousand acres to 95,000 acres uh, in, in size. And the fire perimeter had to be within at least 15 kilometers of populated areas. And uh, that was really just so we knew that people we were surveying were kind of aware of the fire and uh, could speak to the impacts and, and the recovery process. 
So uh, in the fall of 2013, we sent a mail survey to approximately 5,000 residents um, in these states. I believe it was approximately 220 people um, per fire. You know, we'd randomly selected people from uh, a sample that we had purchased through an organization that provides that information. And we selected randomly, I think 220 people from each of those 25 communities for a total of 5,000 residents. We received 819 surveys in response. So I, I'm just gonna briefly cover what we asked in the survey. This will be a big list, but again, our goal was really to understand this outcome variable or this um, dependent variable, which was really perceptions of, of post-fire landscape recovery. Uh, so we had asked people if they were concerned that the landscape wouldn't recover, uh, if they were concerned if ecosystem components and processes would be the same after the fire. Um, we asked them if it was recovering more quickly than they anticipated after the fire, and we combined those, um, those items into kind of one factor, one variable for perceptions of landscape recovery. And then the predictor variables we included in the survey, which were basically the factors that we expected would um, influence how people perceive post-fire landscape recovery, included uh, the beliefs about uh, the ecological role of fire and fire impacts. Basically, is, is fire a natural and healthy part of the ecosystem? Um, loss of landscape attachment is a big construct, and that's basically talks about how we're connected with the landscape, and if we're happy to be in that landscape, if we feel attached to it or connected to it, if we go there for recreation, if it has special meaning to us, those kinds of things. So we measured that. Uh, we measured if if their um, if the respondents' income depended on the landscape. You know, are they a rancher or a logger or anything like that? Uh, we asked if they had previous experience with fires, how long they lived in the area, uh, if they felt the fire was typical or more extreme than than normal fires in that area. Uh, we asked them to what extent they had been noticing erosion in the area. And then we also asked uh, how far away their home was from the fire uh, perimeter. And then we also included the duration of the fire and the size of the fire in our regression models um, to try to predict perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery. And then we included socio-demographic variables like age and education and income and a couple other things. So, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of, of the findings, and um, I did just want to touch on, on this main, um, just an overall finding that what this is basically showing is that um, overall perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery were generally positive. So on the scale from negative two to positive two, you could think of a positive two being uh, the respondent thought the landscape was um, either recovered or well on its way to recovery. Negative two would mean they did not, they thought it was not recovered or uh, significantly negatively impacted. So for the most part, each of these bars uh, represents uh, a different wildfire. So there's 25 bars here. So you can see most of them generally fall on the relatively positive side, not overly positive, but uh, one to two years after a fire, most of these respondents were generally saying they're generally positive um, perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery. So I'm just gonna focus on the, the results. We ran uh, re multiple regression models, these statistical techniques to try to see which, uh, which of these predictor variables uh, had the most influence or affected uh, perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery the most. So. The, the variables I listed here were the ones that were statistically significant. So I'll just run through these quick and I'll throw in a plug for our, our publication from this work at the bottom of, of this slide here, if you'd like to uh, read a whole lot more details about it. But basically we found that uh, the more that post-fire landscape attachment um, was negatively affected, 
than the more negative uh, perceptions of, of post-fire landscape recovery were. So if somebody felt their attachment to the landscape was very much negatively affected by the impacts of the fire, they were more likely to rate um, the perceptions of, their perceptions of landscape recovery were much more negative. So the landscape was not as recovered in that case. Uh, if people believed that fire's ecological role in the landscape was positive and that the forest health was improved by the fire or was in good condition after the fire, people were more likely uh, to see percep their perceptions of landscape recovery were, were more positive. Uh, if they noticed a lot of erosion, perceptions of, of landscape recovery were more negative. Uh, people who had experienced longer fires, um, more, you know, fires that lasted a higher number of days, uh, they also had uh, more negative perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery. Uh, and then also people who lived farther away uh, from a fire perimeter also had more negative perceptions of landscape recovery. And we'll kind of go into more details about that here, I think, towards the end. But I did want to kind of dive into the second study that, that we did around that same time. And uh, this was more of an in-depth case study where we interviewed residents of one particular town associated with one, one particular fire in that area. So the town we, we selected was Roundup, Montana. It's about an hour north of Billings, Montana. Uh, there's really two main kind of groups or categories of residents. The first being um, multi-generational ranchers who've lived there a long time. Uh, we, I'll refer to, to these folks as, as working landscape residents. And then um, the other group is these rural lifestyle or more recent residents. These are folks who had kind of moved up from Billings or other places, and they really came here to get away from from the crowds, uh, from traffic, you know, to have privacy. And a lot of them came there for the aesthetics and to, li to, to live in the, in the forests and have, have privacy. Um, so, you, so, you know, we picked this area because just for one, it, it, it was an interesting opportunity to see how these really different uh, groups of residents, you know, perceive landscape recovery based on just their different backgrounds, different values for the landscape, different reasons for living there. Uh, so the Dahl fire was a wildfire that started in 2012 uh, in June. It was lightning ignited uh, just outside of, um, of Roundup, Montana in the Bull Mountains and burned 22,000 acres in total. It was pretty extreme fire behavior. Uh, there was quite a bit of, uh, there was about 70 homes lost in that fire very quickly too, uh, really in a matter of hours. Um, and certainly a significant impact to the landscape as well. Uh, pretty high mortality rates for a lot of the trees in the area. Um, and just generally pretty, pretty significant impacts all around. So. Uh, we did interviews, we did, we interviewed 39 different people. Um, we made sure to kind of get a balance of, of working landscape and, and rural lifestyle residents. Um, we recorded the interviews, transcribed them and did some analysis to kind of pull out the main themes from the interviews. Uh, we asked about a lot of things in the interviews, but you know, we kind of started with their history in the area, why the area was important to them, why, what they value about the area and the landscape. We asked about their experience with wildfires. Um, we asked about the role of how they perceive the role of fire in the Bull Mountains and other areas like national parks. Um, and then we talked about what perceptions of landscape recovery were to them. We showed them pictures of um, different pictures of, of the landscape, uh, both that had been burned um, recently as well as previous fires. Um, so we kind of had this range of we worked with fire ecologists to pick a range of photos that really show this kind of trajectory of uh, post-fire landscape recovery and use that to really try to elicit, just understand, you know, which components of, of the landscape were important to people and how they talked about perceptions of landscape recovery. 
So I'm just going to give a quick overview of some of the commonalities between the two groups and how they perceive post-fire landscape recovery, and then I'll go into some of the differences. And uh, one thing that we noticed was that really all of the participants talked about fire and um, the post-fire landscape recovery process as this kind of natural process. Uh, almost all of them mentioned this concept of mother nature or, um, you know, one person said it's just nature. Um, another said mother nature cleans herself up in her own way and now she's letting things grow back. So uh, really at the core of kind of people's perceptions of fire and recovery were this, that there are these natural processes. Uh, we also found that people used past wildfires to talk about the Dahl fire and the landscape recovery process um, in a couple different aspects. It, one was the historical role of fire. A lot of people mentioned Yellowstone um, as it's healthier for the forest there. Uh, also in that area, one person said, I've seen old photographs of the Bull Mountains and there were very few trees and that was because of regular fire, this person was saying. They also used fire to uh, past fires to, to think about fire behavior and impacts. So one person said the 1984 Hawk Creek fire, which was basically across the street from the Dahl fire, pretty much burned everything. The Dahl fire didn't. It left a lot of trees um, here and there. So no, it won't quite look as bad. Um, so they used the, what they knew about past fires to help them think about what the Dahl fire landscape was going to look like in the future. They also used past fires to, to think about climate and ecological process is. So one person said nothing ever comes back. This is called the High Plains Desert. That's what the area is. They don't get a lot of moisture. So they kind of use that to, this person was, was basically saying they didn't expect a lot of trees to come back um, because of, of these climate and ecological factors. Another area where there was quite a bit of agreement was just that part of the overall recovery process for everybody really meant removing signs of the horrifying experiences associated with the Dahl fire. So there's a lot of evacuations. Um, it was a very traumatic experience for, for the community uh, collectively and, and most people there. Um, and charred trees and these signs of fire on the landscape a year or two after the fire were really objects that people used to discuss recovery. And, and, and it showed how much those objects were related to emotional experiences. Um, so in this way, elements of the landscape and landscape recovery process were really important aspects of how people coped with the experience and aftermath of the fire. Removing the dead trees was part of the healing process. So this person said the charred trees invoked our memory that was not fun to go through. When we left, I couldn't get the pickup and gear and all I saw was these little balls. The pine cones were exploding and hitting the truck. I wasn't sure if we were gonna make it out of there. It petrified my granddaughter, so that's not a good memory. So to them, you know, part of the emotional process of, of dealing with the fire and, and moving on and, um, was really connected to parts of the landscape that were affected by the fire and removing um, these signs of the fire were an important part of, of emotional aspects as well as the landscape recovery process for them. So I'll just go into a little bit more detail about each group here. Um, the rural lifestyle residents, this was uh, the group, you know, the, people who moved up from Billings in the 70s and 80s, um, more recent residents, uh, people who came here for privacy and aesthetic reasons. So for them, um, a recovered landscape really was largely defined by pre-fire conditions. Um, you know, it's, it's recovered when it's back at, at how it looked before, when there's dense trees, wildlife, um, when it looks the same, and, and really when they have the same privacy that they had before. One person said, I don't want to live on a prairie, thank you. That's why I moved here, because of the trees. Another said, I'm not looking at it from nature's standpoint. I'm looking at it from my own personal standpoint. Uh, another talked about the, the landscape would not recover um, in their lifetime. A um, couple of years after the fire, we did see, you know, people were 
some of these people in this group were really trying to see the positive aspects, um, pointing out more flowers, better views, uh, actually being able to see more wildlife sometimes because of those better views. Um, and for the most part, uh, folks in this group really supported full fire suppression moving ahead. They supported seeding and uh, removing dead trees really for aesthetic purposes to bring back that, um, you know, there's different elements of the landscape that were important to them. And it, one important part is just back to this quote about not looking at it from nature's standpoint, looking at it from my own personal standpoint. That's kind of a, a big difference between rural lifestyle residents and, and this, the working landscape residents and kind of touch on that. But uh, here, you know, they really see themselves as separate from these ecological processes in the landscape um, and not necessarily living together with it. This photo in particular, I thought elicited some really interesting differences. We had kind of just showed people this and asked them what they thought. This, this uh, landscape had been burned by a fire about 30 years ago, and it was across the street from the Bell Fire. People in the rural lifestyle uh, group had really, they just talked about this as being a terrible landscape. You know, it's infested with weeds. Um, I don't know why you'd want to live on a barren land like that. Um, you know, just really just nothing positive about this landscape. Uh, the working landscape residents really, yeah, you know, they, they talked about it from a ranching standpoint, but this person also says, yeah, from a ranching standpoint, it's it's recovered. There's a, tr a few trees coming back. Um, from a scenic standpoint, no, it hasn't recovered. It's gonna take um, a lot of years. Um, but he says from an owner of the land that wants multiple uses, it's not recovered. And that was kind of a, a key difference with these working landscape, um, these ranchers basically, uh, this, this group of residents where they really, uh, I think looked at the landscape with, with an item more of the different values and the landscape um, and not just scenic or timber or grazing, but kind of the whole thing. And uh, they had more experience with fire locally. Uh, they, they had seen fires in that area and experienced fires there. Uh, and a lot of times they benefited off of fire. They, you know, grasses are often um, obviously better after fires. So a lot of them had been using fires to some extent on their own land with prescribed burning to increase the grass, improve the grass uh, for their cattle. So uh, they, they basically had this kind of perception that recovered landscape was one that satisfied multiple values, both aesthetic and utilitarian. Uh, for them, they wanted to allow disturbances to occur and they used prescribed fire to mimic, mimic natural processes in large part because their livelihood depended on it, but they also um, understood that it's an, a natural part of, of the ecosystem. So just this last photo here, this, uh, they, you know, kind of on the extreme side of things, a lot of these residents, like I said, in the ranching community were using fire. Um, they, they recognized that uh, a, a recovered landscape to them is when fire is back on the landscape and they're living with it. One person said that nature works perfectly if we just leave it alone. Uh, you can work, you have to work with it, not against it. Then you won't have to stay, stay up all night being worried about it. So to them, landscape recovery is when natural processes are back and um, functioning in a healthy way. So uh, just a summary of, of those findings, perceptions of landscape recovery were rooted in one's understanding of natural processes and fire's role um, on a landscape. Differences really emerged based on past experiences with fires, beliefs about the ecological role of fire and different values for the landscape. Perceptions of landscape recovery also affected attitudes towards future management of forests and fires. So whether they preferred planting or seeding or really doing prescribed burning and future forest thinning. So I do just wanna really quick highlight a couple other research um, papers that have, have come out recently. This one in 2012 is a little older, but uh, found that just, uh, again, different signs of fire are really important. Found that people really prefer 
post-fire environments that kind of like a, a savanna or an oak savanna landscape where you have like spacing between trees. It's not too dense. It's kind of like a neat landscape. That's how we refer to it sometimes. Uh, another study, a lot of, there's a group of people that have really been looking at this idea of landscape identity and how it's affected by fires, uh, which is similar to landscape attachment, but they've really been looking a lot in Australia and um, different parts of the world about how fires affect landscape identity and how people and communities deal with that uh, after a fire event. And then more recently, uh, some folks in California did a study with hikers and post-fire landscapes, and they really found that getting out and um, experiencing a burn landscape um, really helped people gain an understanding of fire's ecological role in the landscape. And... Um, and led to more positive perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery. Just kind of similar to, to what we found with a couple of our studies where people who had been out in the landscape more often and saw the recovery happening, like new grasses and flowers, they, were, they had more positive perceptions about recovery. So uh, again, beliefs in, about ecological processes and disturbances affect perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery. Values for the landscape affect perceptions of landscape recovery. Uh, all of our research has shown pretty positive evaluations generally after the first couple of years. Uh, the time after a fire, I think, is a really important time to get out into a landscape uh, with, with experts and, and everybody, with neighbors and friends. Um, to, to see the, the changes firsthand and uh, to see what's going on and experience this kind of ecological process happening. Um, and then the landscape recovery, I think, is a good opportunity to talk about forest management and preparing for, for future forests. So the last thing here is I do just want to mention uh, there's a lot of important, I think, opportunities down in southwestern Colorado to do this type of research um, about post-fire landscape recovery. MSI and a lot of other people, um, you know, Dr. Julie Korb and others, uh, as well as who we heard from last week, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Cartier, uh, have presented their research. So I, I think there's a lot of research happening in that area about economic impacts, um, about ecological impacts as well. And there's significant data sets um, that's monitoring vegetation, both using ground vegetation monitoring data as well as uh, remotely sensed data. And um, there's a great set of comparison photos from I think all the way from 2003 to 2017 from the Missionary Ridge fires. Uh, so there's all this great data out there. And I, I think it's just a great opportunity to to bring in some social science and integrate that because all of these data sets tell different stories and um, about recovery and about people's roles with, with their landscape and, and the recovery process. And I think um, bringing the social aspect of that and integrating some of that data would, would be really helpful and give us a, a really comprehensive perspective of it. So I, I will just end here just kind of saying, you know, I think from our, my perspective and from what I've heard in fire ecology classes that we really think of the post-fire environment as the next pre-fire environment. And these efforts really, uh, these issues really require us to look collaboratively across landscapes and across people at different values and priorities across the landscape. So a ton of opportunities to integrate perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery and values for the landscape and attitudes about management with all these exciting things going on in the Southwest right now, whether it's risk assessments, shared stewardship, Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, uh, all these kind of cross-boundary work, uh, post-fire bear efforts. Um, and Allison's gonna talk about community uh, planning assistance for wildfires. And I just think there's a lot of opportunities to bring in perceptions of recovery here. So again, just interdisciplinary and integrated perspectives are really needed to, um, to look at this more holistically. So that's, that's it. Thanks for, for listening and happy to um, answer some questions.
Okay, so I'm just scrolling through here. Okay, so we've got a question from Mike. Um, he said, what factors would you hypothesize would influence people's perceptions of fire in the Animus River value? Ignition source, recreation use of the landscape, um, of the burn landscape. And yeah, I think that's that question. So yeah, really great. Um, Great question. I honestly, my goal uh, for going down um, to be a part of this series today was to go a few days early and meet with folks and uh, get a better sense of, of the landscape and some of the different issues happening down there. Um, all great questions. I, I think ignition source is really important, you know, whether it's a prescribed fire, whether it's a wildfire, whether it's a managed fire. You, you know, I, I do think that that has a, a big impact to how people perceive post-fire landscape recovery was it you know lightning ignited or human caused um, I, I do think all of those things factor into that uh, in terms of whether or not how they see it as a natural process and uh, just you know that's obviously going to have a big impact on whether perceptions are kind of positive or negative moving forward um, yeah, the recreation use is, is huge there. And I, I know there's, you know, wilderness areas. I, I think that's one reason why it's just an exciting landscape to do more research there. There is all these different values and uses of the landscape. And um, that is a goal, actually, hopefully of us, of ours to get down there and um, look into that more carefully and get a sense of um, some of those different, how those different uses affect perceptions of recovery. Because Recreation really wasn't a big uh, factor in Roundup where we did our case study as all private land and just it just wasn't a, a big deal there. So yeah, good question, Mike. And hopefully we can look into that more carefully here. Uh, another question from the Colorado Native Plant Society. Do you think a good climate year uh, following fire that hypothetically supports better wildflower blooms would shift people's perspectives on fire to be more positive? Uh, yeah, that's a, a really good question. And I, I think certainly short-term perceptions, you know, of, of the landscape would, are going to be more positive. Um, I, I think a fire overall, there's a lot of other, you know, aspects that go into that beyond just seeing wild flowers. You, you know, it's like some of the group that we talked to in Roundup um, certainly it helps. It, it definitely helps. Um, but I think, you know, it didn't change people's minds about fire in a lot of situations. They still want trees and, you know, it's it's one aspect, but maybe not sufficient to, to really uh, increase people's views or uh, their, how they positively view fire. Um, question from, from Marcy. Uh, from what you learned in these Montana communities, what social studies should we consider in, in Southwest Colorado? Uh, yeah, so it's a really good uh, question. And I, you know, kind of touched on that. And I, I think um, to me that there's such a, I really like the landscape because, you know, the for this type of fire, you've got the 416 fire and the Missionary Ridge fire uh, kind of across the street from each other there again. So it's just a great opportunity to, look at perceptions of fire, a fire recovery, a landscape recovery in these landscapes over kind of a long period of time, you know, 20, almost 20 years or so in, in the case of the Missionary Ridge fires. So I think it offers a good comparison. Um, and then, yeah, again, different uses for the landscape, more recreation um, use there for one. And um, just, uh, you know, I, I need to learn a little bit more about the communities down there too. And understand exactly what research there would look like. But uh, to me, the, the big, the thing that's really exciting is there's all this great ecological data that MSI and uh, Dr. Julie Korb have, you know, the, the remotely sensed data, uh, comparison photos, tons of vegetation 
monitoring data, water, you know, quality data from from both fires for um, a period of time after them and, and regularly. So that's huge. So we can really tell like a pretty comprehensive story, at least for like the Missionary Ridge fire at this point, about post-fire landscape recovery. And I, I think we can use those tools to to see how how do people's um, perceptions of post-fire landscape recovery line up with what we're finding in that other data? Um, do they notice? Do do you know? Does the average person notice these changes that we're seeing with these other data sets? Um, and a, a big part of that is we can really use that to tailor communication strategies. And uh, if there's misperceptions out there, or just uh, you know if people think there's there's certain things happening that aren't, or if they're not aware of, of certain recovery patterns happening in different areas, then I think uh, doing some social science initially and continuing that effort to really uh, compare these perceptions versus what we're seeing with other data sets, I think is a good way to tell the whole story and to to really use that all of that information together to think forward about the next fire and how to plan for that and you know really have these conversations of what do we want the landscape to look like how do we want it to function and how are we going to plan for that and i think that's really where it integrates in with um, all the exciting stuff that's happening down there with uh, these quantitative risk assessments with the forest service work around pods um, and all this work with on the county level too and then just so much cross boundary work going there. Just it's really ripe for um, bringing in these different perspectives and thinking about what we want to see moving ahead. Uh, another question, general question said, uh, I mentioned that people who live farther away from locations have more negative perceptions of the fire. Why do you think that is? Uh, does it have something to do with not being on the land and seeing the changes? Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I think, you know, you drive by a landscape once in a while, um, you, you might, or, and you haven't been there for a while, it's, you know, I think really what's gonna stick in your head is probably that first, in your mind, is probably that first time you drove past that landscape after the fire when everything was charred, maybe still smoldering and really looked just uh, devastated, you know, and barren or just heavily impacted. And I, I think unless you're, out there seeing it or closer and seeing changes happen every day. Um, yeah, you're not gonna notice that stuff. And it's, it's easy to have, um, just kind of see it as, as still being pretty barren. And uh, we see, you know, grass and, and flowers, you know, things start coming up in some areas very quickly, um, sometimes depending on the fire characteristics, but, um, uh, you know, that was a lot of trees also look burnt, but they're actually alive. That's one kind of misperception we notice a lot um, that the tree looks dead, but it's really alive in a couple of years, it's fine. So yeah, I, I think just living that, living closer really um, has a lot to do with it and getting out, just like that hiking study, you know, just getting out and seeing it, seeing the, the landscape is intriguing to people and generally leads to a deeper understanding of, of the process. Um, and then another general question was that it, it seems like there are many complexities when considering recovery versus cyclical dynamism of landscapes. Um, how can those in education and communication support communities in education and learning about and seeing the larger ecological picture of fire on the landscape, intrinsic value of fire versus seeing or intrinsic value of the landscape um, versus seeing the landscape as having use to us within shorter periods of time and thinking like, I'll never enjoy that forested area again in my lifetime. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a big question. And I, I, I do think this um, type of research is really important for education and outreach. And I probably have to think about that to come up with more articulate answer. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. And um, I, I think, you know, one, one thing is, is I think just getting out to the landscape, I guess, just to touch back on the last question of, of you know, I think just it, it field trips, any um, anything that community leaders and extension agent, agents and educators can do to 
show people the landscape and to talk about them. And, you know, it's one thing to just send an email or do a presentation and talk about the role of fire. But I think to get out there and have those conversations, even virtually, you know, whether it's through videos, um, I think in a lot of cases, seeing is believing and to have those conversations about the role of fire. Um, I think it's really powerful to see photos from the past, like a hundred years ago and where fire was part of these landscapes and you have forests that were clearly thinned out by fires. Um, and they look like these like park stands, like Ponderosa forests that are really nice looking um, forests. Um, and yeah, I, but you know, I guess a bigger question around that really is is that we want to be careful because a lot of landscapes aren't going to come back to what they were before. And if they are, it's likely not in our lifetimes. So uh, especially in these drier areas, you know, it's going to take a long time. And I think that's why it's really important to get out there and have those conversations of, okay, this happened and here's what we might expect in the future. Um, and so how do we, how do we live with that? You know, it's a big part of living with fire and, what do we want to see and um, using those dialogues and conversations and examples to look at other areas of the landscape that have not been burned yet, um, that are going to burn at some point and to think about, okay, how can we manage those landscapes now to get to where we want, you know, we know they're gonna have a fire, what can we do? Um, you know, it might require prescribed burning or just larger landscapes, cross boundaries, um, type of planning to, to think about that and the, what we want to see in the future and how we want to get there. And I, I think the landscape recovery aspect or concept helps us have that conversation. It's kind of a midpoint in between experience of fire and thinking about the next fire. Uh, another person said, I want to miss one here, said, uh, how have you seen post-fire perceptions influence pre-fire planning? So yeah, it's a really great question and, and something I, I actually wanna dive into more. Um, you know, and I, I, think, I think there's a lot of opportunities for that, especially when, and maybe Allison can, can touch on that to some extent and thinking about the community planning um, assistance for wildfires, but uh, certainly when communities put together like community wildfire protection plans, you know, I think that's a good time to bring all these different elements together, like the factors that affected perceptions of recovery. So thinking about values on the landscape, uh, thinking about what we want the landscape to look like in the future and what we're willing to do to get to there, whether it's put up with some smoke from prescribed fire and potential risks of prescribed fires, more thinning, uh, different approaches to to managing fire risk um, across different landscapes. So yeah, I think it's really important um, to think about where that fits in. I, I think certainly when you're talking about fire risk assessments, um, planning for future fires, you know, that's a, a good time to, to think about that. You know, what kinds of post-fire landscapes are we willing to accept in different areas and how can we kind of manage accordingly to see sort of a range of uh, post-fire impacts um, and just, just how landscapes function a, across a given area. So the last question I see is just in my research or literature, have I collected information about where whether there are differences in post-fire um, recovery perceptions, uh, where there are active collaborative groups compared to where there are not? Um, that's a fantastic question. I've not heard that. Um, I, I'm not aware of that, frankly. I, I'm going to write that down because that's a great um, idea and it's super important. You know, the role of collaborative groups are obviously so important, especially in the Southwest region and, and, and everywhere else, really. So, uh, yeah, my sense is, you know, having those groups would, would certainly lead to. Uh, opportunities for more formal and structured conversations about these issues. Um, and so I think just that, having that dialogue before fires um, and talking about before a fire happens, like really thinking about the post-fire landscape and um, 
getting some expectations in, in line. And um, I think collaborative groups, you know, have a, provide a great um, venue for doing that and getting people to think about these things collectively in a kind of more structured manner. And, and then you have this whole group of people that can go out to their network and um, kind of share these conversations and perspectives too. So great question. Uh, I think the last question is if I have recommendations for how communities who have experienced wildfire could organize field trips to post wildfire landscapes uh, in order to encourage positive relationships to fire processes. So certainly a really important question. And yeah, it, it's really tough. I, you know, I'm up here in Fort Collins. Uh, we've had some fires in this area. I know the Red Feather Lakes area is, has tried to uh, do a lot of this before and after prescribed by fires, for example, I know uh, they've had some success getting groups of people out with them and, um, you know, I, but I know it's also really difficult to get a, really a, a good portion or obviously even a majority of, of, of people out to a landscape. So it's, it's tough. It's, there's a lot of factors that go into that. You're not going to get most people through that So I, to, to be able to go out and see the landscapes. I, I think Certainly outreach is huge, you know, I, uh, to an extent, it, it, I don't know, personally, I'm not an outreach expert, but I, I do think um, person to person, you know, contact the extent that land managers can work with community leaders, show that they're united and find the people in the communities who who are having these dialogues and, and have strong networks. Um, you know, I think that they're really important to connect with and um, just try to be as visible as possible about the opportunities like for field trips and that kind of thing, just sharing it widely. Um, you know, I don't know if it's providing some kind of credits or like extension credits, learning credits, you know, working with businesses, that kind of thing. I, certainly a lot of things out there. I, I'm sure others would have more articulate um, ideas about that, but yeah, really important. And I, I would just say, I guess just, to stay at it. I think this is the best way. I, I think trying reaching people virtually, getting people out there in person as, as best we can through different ways. So cool. I think that's it. These are really helpful questions. And I can I hope I can um, save this Zoom chat box so I can keep them because they're awesome. So thanks so much for for listening and I'll turn it over to Emily and Allison. All right, very cool. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Oystra, for sharing your research. It's so fascinating to hear about the differences in people's relationships and perceptions to landscapes um, post wildfire. So thank you so much again for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Allison Lehman, uh, who works as the La Plata uh, County Planner One. Um, Allison obtained her master's in public administration, concentrating in environmental law, policy, and management from CU Denver. While attending school, Allison worked full-time as a planning analyst for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And after obtaining her degree, she worked for a nonprofit developing and implementing educational programs. During this time, she became a wildland firefighter and worked for Boulder County Sheriff's Department Fire Management Office. In her wildland firefighter capacity, Allison completed multiple prescribed burns and mitigation projects and was a responder on multiple incidents. Allison was integral in the implementation of a first in the nation program called Wildfire Partners. The program piloted in 2014 in Boulder County was so successful at helping homeowners reduce their risk to wildfire that the Board of County Commissioners adopted Wildfire Partners standards into building and land use code. Allison worked for the United States Forest Service in land use planning and currently is a planner one for La Plata County Planning Department. Awesome, very cool. So with that, I'll go ahead and 
hand it off to you, Allison. Thank you. Um, Allison, we've got a mic mute challenge. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. I'll start. Okay. There you go. All <laughs> right. I'll, I'll do it all again. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, I wanted to thank MSI for it's still not on. Yeah, you can hear me. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to thank MSI for the opportunity to present tonight. And also thank you to the sponsors who made this forest and fire learning series happen. It's great we were able to do this despite all of us having to be at home participating and watching. And thank you for everyone who's joining us online. It's you who are essential in getting out the word and making changes to help make our communities resilient. So really appreciate your uh, listening and asking great questions. Uh, so I work for La Plata County and my goal tonight is to talk a little bit about the current code in La Plata County and uh, how that interacts with wildfire. I'm also going to talk to you about an exciting program that La Plata County is participating in and what the results of that program could be. And then finally, I'm going to end with some recommendations for how all of us can be resilient, how we can uh, make improvements to prepare ourselves for wildfire. Uh, just to get started before I launch in, I want everyone to take a moment and think about what makes where you live important to you. What's so valuable to you? So it, think of some adjectives, think of some important places. I'm just gonna let those thoughts settle in. Okay, so now that you've pictured those places and thought of all your happy words, uh, I bet that the majority of you out there thought of trails and hiking and forests and the woods and um, the mountain views that we have, all these things that are our natural resources. And in our passion, we fail to recognize that we have a role in forest resiliency and forest health. So, um, really is a great follow-up to what Chad was talking about earlier. We all are a critical part of reminding ourselves what it means to have healthy forests and the fires are a natural process of that. That our role is to encourage fire in reality. So um, let's talk about how La Plata County uh, looks at homeowners and handles uh, code. So when someone buys a property, whether it has a house on it or not, they have use by right that they can build a home there. And what that means in that process of building a home, there isn't land use required. So already there are, um, what I would see as a planner, some challenges and how we're communicating to the public about what can be done as far as wildfire. So really, where do we have that opportunity for involvement? When it comes to land use, we get calls from people who want to subdivide their property. They might want to do a boundary adjustment, a lot consolidation, 
all these projects, um, usually when they're in that kind of just minor, we're talking about one or two parcels of land, um, there's a really basic process involved. And we always go to the code. I'm gonna get into more detail about that in a moment, but there are four main considerations that a planner in the land use department looks at with every project. And that is water, sewer, and access. And then the last one, La Plata County has 12 planning districts. Of the 12, there is only one, the Animus Valley that has zoning. Outside of the Animus Valley, the other 11 districts do not have, uh, have zoning. All of the parcels have what's called classifications. And so that could be a large, uh, large residential, it could be agriculture, it could be commercial, it really depends. And so when a project is proposed, what the land use department is looking at is compatibility with that classification and with the surrounding land. So just to give you a quick idea of that. Now, I wanna dig more into uh, what's involved from the code perspective. I will say there are hundreds of pages of code. So I am not going to reiterate those for you this evening. Really what I want to talk, uh, talk about or bring to your attention is that the existing code contains minimal considerations regarding wildfire. And so to me as a planner, this is a big concern. When it comes to large subdivisions, Edgemont for instance, there, there was a fire, uh, wildfire plan required. So there are some code requirements, but they're minimal and they really don't go to the extent that is possible that you see in a lot of other communities. When it comes to building code, La Plata County did, did adopt the International uh, Fire Code of 2003. And that code uh, about every two years is updated. So it's gone through five iterations since 2003, the most recent being 2018. And the reason that's so important to mention is every time the code is updated, that's because an incident occurred. There was a structure fire or a wildfire. Something happened where the experts made a conclusion. They saw what happened and then realized what could be done to prevent this damage in the future. And so with each new version of the code, there's additions that take into consideration this collective learning knowledge that we have. Uh, so that's a great thing. That's something that we need to kind of continue to learn from and take into consideration for how La Plata County can improve. The International Fire Code it addresses a few things. So hydrants and sprinklers, open burning, um, access and egress, the uh, kitchen stove hoods, storing of materials, including hazardous materials, and then uh, roofs and vents are uh, a pretty, pretty common fire thing that's addressed. So uh, we do see some things that are looked at. There is more that can be done. And what we know from the hazard assessment mapping that's available for Colorado, there's a program, the uh, it's called CORAP, Colorado Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal. And the mapping shows La Plata County, that's what we're looking at here, as having the majority of residents in either highest or high risk for wildfire concern. Meaning where homes are built, there's a very high risk of wildfire. So this said, we do know we have very qualified responders ready to come out when there is a fire and respond to that fire. The reality is that they cannot be everywhere at once. And 
the question that I look at, you know, the, the uh, challenge that we look at from uh, a, a land use perspective is we know that wildfires can have residual impacts that can be even greater, if not as great as the wildfire. And so what we saw after 416 is flooding impacts that were substantial to homes. So there are many things that have a, a greater impact uh, in addition to just the wildfire that are all why land use planning is, is really important. So having this perspective, how do we prepare? Do home buyers, when they're buying a house, know that it's in a high risk area? Or when they're going to build on a new property, do they know that that's a high risk area? And then even if they do, how do they know what to do? How do they know what can be done to make their home safer and reduce its risk against wildfire? So I would say right now, we're not doing enough. And these images, none of them are from La Plata County. So just a disclaimer on that, but it just goes to show wildfire happens and the impacts can be huge. They can be tremendous to a community. So what can we do in order to reduce that risk? That's why La Plata County is participating in a program. It goes by the acronym CPA. And I'm gonna kind of switch from this background now to talking about the present tense, the activity that La Plata County is currently participating in. CPA stands for Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire. And this is actually a grant that CPA, or sorry, that La Plata County applied to and received. The grant is funded through the United States Forest Service and uh, Private Foundation and Headwaters Economics. And the grant team or, or CPA team is made up of experts who are working directly with La Plata County as well as five other counties in the nation were selected. So it's a pretty big honor. We started the program in January and it's a six month program. So concluding in August, the CPA team will have final products that I'll be talking about in a few slides. The CPA team has worked in over 30 counties around the nation and they have a hands-on approach that involves working with the county planning department and then these stakeholder groups looking at what is currently happening and then what can be built upon in order to reduce the wildfire risk. So for La Plata County, we had goals that we wanted to achieve by going through the CPA process. And those goals are outlined on the left side of the slide here. Part of the goal is getting recommendations finding out from these, the experts on the CPA team, what can La Plata County do as far as land use and building code for high risk zones in the WUI? And for those of you who aren't familiar with the WUI, that stands for Wildland Urban Interface. And that's areas where there's natural lands, lands that are undeveloped, and then they come up adjacent to lands where there are structures that are developed. The C, or sorry, the La Plata County also wants uh, to know more about where the fuels are, where there's difficult terrain, uh, where there are these high risk areas. So the CORAP map that I showed previously is something that's generalized for the state of Colorado. It does not look at the conditions, the weather patterns, the lo location specific things about La Plata County, where we know are gonna influence fire behavior. CPA is specialized at doing that. And so that's one of the things that La Plata County is looking to achieve through this process is, is getting a fire hazard assessment map that accurately depicts what the risks are, 
where those risks are, and then can be used, streamlined by the four fire prote protection districts in La Plata County. And then um, finally, how to best prepare for wildfire occurrences. What are things that we can do that build our resiliency now and prepare us for the future for when wildfire is here? Uh, this is no hard task for CEPA. This is what they do. I'd mentioned they've worked in 30 communities around the nation. They intend the whole purpose behind CEPA is to improve land use planning and help communities in fire prone areas so that they can develop, they can grow, they can thrive with wildfire in mind. So what a great partnership we have here to learn so much from this experience and be able to build on that. They start by looking at what existing plans we have in place. So in La Plata County, that includes uh, the hazard mitigation plan that the Office of Emergency Management published, the community wildfire protection plans that many communities throughout La Plata County have produced, as well as uh, work with the fire protection districts on producing, and then the land use code. All these things are active already in existence, how can they be bolstered to better support wildfire planning? And then uh, they have uh, a number of different softwares as well as a expert in GIS who creates this hazard assessment map. So uh, all of these things fit into the goals that La Plata County has and will fit into the final products that we're excited to get. So before I get to those, I just wanted to really quickly share with you the stakeholders who monthly are sitting down on a group call where we talk to the CEPA team. These stakeholders are assisting in supporting uh, the discussion about what our challenges are here in La Plata County, what our conditions are, providing the data for the hazard assessment map, the insight on our weather patterns, and then ultimately being able to weigh in on what recommendations are, are, are strong, are encompassing what's realistic here for La Plata County. And I've referred a couple times to the final products. So the final products is what CPA is working on producing. I'd mentioned in August, that's the conclusion of the grant in their program. So in August, what they will present to La Plata County is recommendations to protect structures in the high risk WUI zones. And potentially that could include land use and or building code regulations. Uh, they're also going to have a wildfire hazard assessment map. So a full map of the county with some tools so that we can utilize that map. And uh, as I'd mentioned previously, streamline that uh, across our fire protection districts. Partners like MSI and wildfire adapted partners can use that in their research or in their conversations with homeowners. So we see great potential in having that map available. <clears throat> Next, I'm gonna explain how the sequence of what CPA is producing and kind of what the next steps are gonna occur. Uh, the CPA team is presenting next week on Tuesday at the Board of County Commissioners meeting. And later in my slide, I'll have a link for anyone who's interested in viewing that. The meeting starts at 10, there's a quick kind of introduction and they accept the previous minutes of the last meeting and then the agenda for this meeting. And then the CPA team is first on the agenda on Tuesday to talk about who they are and what they're doing with La Plata County. So that's a great opportunity, um, particularly just for interested residents in La Plata to understand what the process involves and how in the future you can be informed to be part of the recommendation development and um, hopefully future implementation in the county. <laughs> Uh, CPA is completing a, a number of stakeholder meetings and a hazard assessment workshop. 
So this is part of that input process that I mentioned with the stakeholder group, where everyone will be at the table sharing their thoughts and giving this information so that the CPA team is able to make recommendations that reflect accurately what is happening here and what the needs are of La Plata County. And then in August, the CPA team will again present to the Boulder County Commissioners. That date is yet to be determined that presentation will be where they officially deliver their products, their recommendations and talk about the map and the high risk areas. So this is the part we're really excited about. And again, when I encourage people to, uh, to who knows at that point, if you're tuning in or if you'll be able to attend in person, but uh, let's be part of that conversation. So the public involvement part is something that La Plata County is prioritizing. So in developing the recommendations, uh, we will be doing what we can to um, host public meetings or it, asking for feedback and in, including that public involvement. And then ultimately, what we hope is to have the Boulder Com County Commissioners take some of these recommendations and move them forward to adopt as what the county can use for future planning against wildfire risk. So that was very quick, all about La Plata County. I mentioned I also want to talk to you about what can you do? What are things that you and your neighbors and all of us have the ability to start doing now? And so this is your call to action. <clears throat> so uh, the first one I have up is joining Wildfire Adapted Partners. They are local to Montezuma, La Plata County, and Dolores County. So if you don't live in one of those counties, don't fear. There is probably a program that you can join in order to get the assistance that Wildfire Adapted Partners provides. They have a number of resources to help homeowners. And the most important is a free assessment. They will come to your home and look at what is happening as far as um, the landscape, as far as the conditions of the home, what are opportunities for embers to embed in your house. And so they will make you a customized list of recommendations. They have a number of resources on their website and programs out there earlier. Emily mentioned that in Boulder County where I, I previously worked, we had a program wildfire partners. So see what's going on in your community and what you can participate in. You can go on the Colorado State Forest Service website. They have the information about what's called the Home Ignition Zone or the HIS. And what Wildfire Adapted Partners uses as their standard is the Colorado State Forest Service standards. So go online now. You can learn about what you can start doing around your property. And very unlike what a lot of perceptions are, this doesn't involve cutting down all your trees. What this looks like is thinning, removing the ability for crown fires where a fire can jump from one tree to another and then onto your home, reducing that risk of a fire coming straight up to the side of the house and then catching, catching the house on fire. So uh, learn about that. Go to the Colorado State Forest Service website. In addition to that, um, there is a great website, readyforwildfire.org. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is it doesn't just have to be wildfire. There could be a situation where you live in an area where there could be tornadoes, there could be flooding concerns or other concerns where having a go bag is important. So this website has a checklist for how you can prepare your go bag. And not only that, I highly recommend that you practice. So it's not just thinking you have that bag and being ready to go. When you put other people in your household into the equation, it can really slow you down. So take the time to practice doing an evacuation. <clears throat> the website readyforwildfire.org also talks about if you have pets, how you can prepare to evacuate your pets. 
uh, communication plans for your family. Say if someone didn't have their phone with them or power goes out, cell towers go out and you name it. So uh, all these things are great things to think about now before that hazard or the wildfires here. And then um, being prepared for the wildfire, think about things in your home if you were to lose them and not have a home to come back to. So do you have documents that are stored online? Do you have pictures of your birth certificate that are stored online? Any of those records and receipts and things. Another important thing that you can find at readyforwildfire.org is how to review your insurance policy and see that it is covering, uh, realistically covering you for if something were to happen now in current time. And then I'd mentioned embers a moment ago, do a walk around your house, get up on the roof and check if there's loose shingles or an area that can be screened and oppor any opportunity to prevent those embers from settling in. The proven way that homes ignite is from the embers. And often it doesn't mean that the fire is right next door. They can be blown in the wind and then because they settled on your home and there's enough material there that's ignitable, a, a wildfire or a house fire can start. So that's, that's what you want to try and prevent. And then talk to your neighbors. What are they doing? Have they done these same things? Are they doing mitigation? Can you combine your efforts? This is a team effort, guys. So let's all start the conversation and work together. And then finally, I want to ask everyone who is in La Plata County to keep an eye on CPA. Let's keep the conversation going. I want to hear from you. I want to talk to you about what your thoughts are and how we can Im improve our reduction of wildfire risk. So that said, here is my contact information. Please feel free to reach me. I'm also sharing next to the uh, symbol of the, the email or the letter, I guess, the link to La Plata County Planning's website. There's a monthly newsletter you can sign up for. That newsletter has all planning things. So it's not just gonna be CPOT, but it will give you helpful information. And then that link next to the calendar is the link for the, the sorry, the La Plata County Commissioners uh, the meeting that is occurring on Tuesday next week, August, or gosh, sorry, April 21st, the link so that you can uh, log into the portal and watch that live. It will also be recorded, so you'll be able to watch that again if there's a more convenient time for you. So that is my closing. I hope everyone was able to jot that down real quickly. And if not, you can see this video tomorrow on MSI uh, on their Facebook page. So thanks for your time. And now I'm happy to answer questions that people have. I already have one. Great. Um, I'm going to answer this question from Amanda. Is CEPA working? Uh, okay, great. So is CEPA working with the Rocky Mountain uh, Restoration Initiative Group? The answer would be no, not quite fully. There are conversations of combining efforts as far as mitigation projects. There are uh, conversations at this point. The CPA recommendations are really going to guide La Plata County on where they want to take future choices as far as reducing wildfire risk. So uh, working with RMRI, the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative is one of the options that uh, is a possibility. And we, and I, I'll, I'll say for myself specifically, uh, would really like to see taking advantage of all these local partnerships and building off the available funding and the available uh, skill and manpower so that we can do larger projects. So great question, thanks. Uh, is there a history of CPA groups working with real estate partners to help inform, <laughs> not scare, potential homeowners and buyers? Moving to rural 
uh, moving to a rural area with higher wildfire potential and danger can be a real reframing for people in terms of risk. Yes, it really can. And in my experience working with homeowners when I was doing uh, wildfire mitigation assessments, most homeowners are not aware. It is something that the real estate market doesn't talk to them about. Uh, most likely intentionally, they don't want to cause concern. That said, I know that local groups here do meet with real estate groups and do lunch and learns and opportunities like that to share information about kind of the positive way to talk about wildfire and how to reduce your risk. Uh, there's not enough of that occurring, and that's why conversations like these are great. CPAW specifically doesn't go out and do outreach. They're working directly with the county and the stakeholder group on this strong path of land use planning. That, that is the goal that, that CPAW intends to do. So when it comes to real estate partnerships, I think that's a conversation that there's many players in, in the locally and um, at the county who can work on that to, to build that capacity. And uh, there's a guide that the department, well, <clears throat> I believe it's the Department of Local Affairs. I actually was able to get it from the Colorado State Forest Service. And it's, I believe it's called a, a Landowner's Guide to Living in Rural Colorado, something like that. Uh, if you talk to Melissa Simmons at the Colorado State Forest Service, she helped me track this down. So that has really good information, whether it be someone who is living off the land and is, uh, is, is uh, a farmer or is someone who is raising cattle or if it's someone who is new and doesn't understand um, how to handle winds, wildfire, flooding, all these things that um, do happen in Colorado. So that's a place that I would also in encourage people to look. Okay, so I hope I answered that for you. Uh, from Erin, when will CPAW deliver their recommendations to La Plata County Commissioners? Yes, in August. Uh, we don't have a date yet. They are working on building those recommendations now, doing the research. And uh, one thing that I, I didn't mention is uh, I'm actually creating a kind of a virtual tour of the county so that they have more understanding of what's occurring on the ground. So all these things are going into CPOB being able to form those recommendations. They will present to La Plata County Commissioners in August. So expect the publication and distribution of the recommendations at that time. And uh, my expectation, I hope, is the hazard assessment map at that time as well. And then do I foresee the county commissioners adopting the recommendations? Uh, yes and no. From looking at the CPA recommendations for other counties, there are generally about a dozen recommendations, some that are kind of general and then some that are very specific. And depending on how specific, it can be more difficult and more time consuming to adopt a recommendation. So the, my expectation is let's, let's kind of look at it as a wave and say, starting with the smaller, more obtainable things, let's start to do implementation there. And then adopting something will very likely come in the future. I would anticipate that not occurring without a more lengthy process involving public. So uh, that's the answer to your question, Erin. <clears throat> okay, general question. Do you know if the Board of County Commissioners meeting on April 21st as well as the Board of County Commissioners will be accessible? Yes, okay. So I shared a link. Let's go back to that. The link at the bottom here, this IQM, oh, apologies, hang on. IQM has the, um, 
it's a it's a portal program where you can live watch the county commissioner meeting. Uh, you can submit feedback. I don't or basically chat what what everyone is doing now to share your thoughts and ask questions. I'm not sure if they're opening that up in that meeting, but at a minimum, yes, you can watch it and yes, you can rewatch it. It's recorded through Zoom and I'm gonna do my best to distribute that Zoom link far and wide. I don't know yet where that will be. I believe at least I can put it on the La Plata County Planning website, but look for that in other places as well. Uh, and then another general question. In what, what ways are differences in public and private land ownership and responsibilities addressed in wildfire planning? Ooh. That could take me another hour. So let me see if I can maybe give you some highlighted uh, idea of, of where that might begin. Um, the kind of biggest thing would be regulation it, through having, I, I was introducing earlier the International Fire Code. So using uh, a, a international fire code, it, accepting it, and then typically there are modifications made that take into account things that happen locally in the county. So for instance, here we have four fire protection districts. So uh, talking about that and what those different responses might look like. So that's, that's kind of one of the, the biggest ones is regulation. Uh, on a smaller scale, uh, providing rebates or incentives for people who use building materials that are more fire resistant could be an example. Uh, fire protection districts or fire departments in some instances are requiring sprinklers and homes depending on the size. So that's a change that, that we've seen in, in parts of the nation and uh, in some cases uh, here in La Plata County. Uh, there's also uh, just asking communities to produce community wildfire protection plans. And then for communities who have those, uh, some states then provide grant funding to those communities so that they can basically make those wildfire uh, plans active, something that they then are doing regularly, that they're going out and doing mitigation and making that those wildfire mitigation projects something that is a regular occurrence for that. Um, the community, the develop, the HOA, whoever submitted the uh, wildfire protection plan. So those are a few examples. Uh, like I said, I can talk a lot more about that. So if you want to reach me directly, my contact's here and I'd love to talk to you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, let's see. And will CPOT inform La Plata County's um, comp plan? Sorry, Marcy, remind me, comp? Comprehensive, yes. Um, okay, so yes, that's one of the ones that they're looking at. So again, going through a, uh, basically, creating a developing a, a new plan adopting a new plan there's much more involved so that's one of the things that i might see later occurring rather than being one of the things at the beginning as far as pursuing recommendations <clears throat> general question do you know of technologies that create simulations of what your property will look like after a defensible space or a wildfire mitigation is completed? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I don't know of any. I do know that there are even wildfire adaptive partners has shown before and after when mitigation occurred on a property. I think those are really great tools to help people understand what it looks like from just removing a couple of trees. Uh, one of the things that we did in Boulder County was a tour. And so neighbors could go to the homes 
of their neighbors where wildfire mitigation was completed and someone who was either in the process of meeting the standards that were part of uh, wildfire partners program or they had completed them. And so it was a great way to ask questions of someone who completed that work and then also see what the difference was before and after. There's images that you could find online. I think there's a number of uh, organizations uh, like the National Fire Protection Association who have resources like that, but that simulation, I mean, one, one of these viewers, whoever is tech savvy, let's make that happen because that's a great idea. Okay, we assume that you've practiced evacuating your home. How long does that take? And um, what were some of the surprising hangups you ran into? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough one. So um, I would say the, the goal, I, I did resiliency training and the goal of this program was to prepare your go bag, complete your evacuation, do it in 10 minutes and then do it in five minutes. I'm not kidding, it's pretty intense. So um, it's possible. But it uh, was definitely not possible for my family. <laughs> so 10 minutes is, is more realistic. Uh, I'd mentioned it's harder, you know, when you're including your household. So we have two pets and then there's just things that you can't pack, such as medications, something that you have on a list and you need to know where that list is, go to the list and then well, one person's checking off those things, the other person is getting that go bag and getting the pets. So that I think that's kind of the, the realistic way to, to share what I learned and uh, suggest to people to do the same thing. Find that list of what's in the bag ready to go and then create your own list of the things that you will get day of and make sure everyone in your house knows where that list is and knows their role. Be ready to divide and conquer. <clears throat> uh, surprising hangups. Yeah, that kind of covers it. I mean, I think uh, when you do it on your own, just have humor because it, it won't go perfectly. And that's part of the point of doing that is, is being aware that uh, you're going to learn from the process. So I hope that's helpful. Is some of, uh, next question, general question, is some of the mapping CPA is doing similar to floodplain mapping that influences building and land use capabilities in La Plata County? I don't know for certain. I don't believe so knowing the software that is being used to create the maps. And uh, for anyone who has a background in GIS and specifically if someone who's worked with the United States Forest Service, you may know the programs uh, that they're using like Flame Map is one of those examples. So FLAM, the mapping tools are incorporating this local data that's being collected and I can ask them about using some of the uh, flood floodplain data that we have but my guess is that that's something that isn't right now part of that hazard it's a, a wildfire hazard assessment map so wow I am glad oh did uh, do I? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, why not? So, um, uh, also not on my stakeholder list. Uh, there are a number of organizations doing great work in La Plata County. So, I'll I'll just quickly do a shout out kind of introduction thing for the Animus Valley River Consortium. They are a group doing a, a really astonishingly amazing work with a lot of uh, intelligent stakeholders who are contributing, and that's all kind of uh, evolving around the Animus Valley and a lot of post. Um, flood considerations. And then the Columbine Collaborative is a, another uh, organization. Uh, this is something that MSI is uh, organizing and it's really similar to kind of the 
232 projects and the initiatives in Dolores and Archuleta where uh, they're doing these uh, forest collaboratives. So though those are also groups that we're communicating with. Um, so this wildfire has hazard assessment map can be streamlined. It can have uh, greater use so that we're including the kind of challenges and observations that everyone else has in what we're building towards as far as recommendations. So um, I hope I, I captured what you were looking for there. And then one more question. Do you see any opportunity for com community engagement and kids teaching their families through citizen science in a way that would help the county? For example, finding out how many trees, oh yes, finding out how many trees, what types uh, are on or near people's properties or on trails on county land. Uh, yeah, that uh, literally that is my dream come true. <laughs> My colleagues at the Forest Service can tell you this is something that I uh, I just think is one of the greatest opportunities because there are those programs out there available where what happens is you can go online and you can record. I have an elm, an aspen, and five ponderosas in my backyard. And then when your neighbor and the next neighbor and people blocks over are all starting to put that information on, it creates this very large crowdsourcing platform where you start to understand what your uh, forest landscape looks like and then have a better way to plan for resiliency because you know then who's gonna be at risk from the next pine beetle, for instance. Um, so uh, I see the opportunity to answer your question. I don't know how that will happen. I think that's an initiative that, uh, you know, MSI is a great fit for that. Um, we did, when I was working at the uh, US Forest Service, we talked about doing something like that through a grant and, uh, it didn't come to fruition, so maybe it can in the future. I am really glad that you asked that and we got to mention it today. So uh, yes, people keep thinking of these ideas because this is a great way to help and in, in, in build the resiliency. And uh, going on, okay. Um, I'm gonna have everyone wait. <laughs> One moment. Okay, I need, I, I'm asking a question to make sure I cover one more thing that might need to be covered and I apologize for making everybody wait. Oh, can't type when I'm. <laughs> oh gosh. <clears throat> Chad, that's for you. Oh, okay. It didn't have to do with me making a fool out of myself. That's excellent. All right. So everyone, thank you for your time and your questions. I am gonna give it back to Emily. Oh, that was really great. Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, we really appreciate that. And, and we really appreciate you sharing with us uh, with us all, the amazing work um, that you've that you've done and the resources that you shared with uh, with our community. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to say thank you for fielding those great questions asked by Amanda and Aaron and Jeremy and Marcy. And I also wanted to say thank you to Mike, Marcy, uh, the Colorado Native Plant Society, and everyone else for your thoughtful questions for Chad. We really appreciate hearing from all of you. Um, so, you know, all right, folks, I think that uh, I think we're wrapping up here for the evening. And I want to say thank you so very much for joining us again this evening and the last three weeks for these really important questions um, for our communities and beyond. Uh, but before you leave, um, don't forget to enter for a chance to win two single day stand up paddleboard, uh, kayak or canoe rentals from Four Corners 
River Sports in two cases, that's eight six packs of Skagwa from Ska Brewing. Just make sure that you're 18 years of, of age or older, that you like or follow Mountain Studies Institute on our Facebook page, and that you complete the survey pinned to this, uh, the comment section of this video in order uh, to have a chance to, um, to win these awesome prizes. Um, I wanna say thank you so very much to our speakers again, Dr. Chad Poistra and Allison Lehman for sharing all of your expertise and your amazing um, research. We really appreciate all of you and all that you do. We really couldn't do this without you. And of course, to our sponsors as well for making this event possible, um, uh, Wildfire Adaptive Partnership, San Juan Citizens Alliance, the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, Garden Sports Outdoors, Durango Outdoor Exchange, Four Corners, River Sports, Maria's Bookshop, Colorado State Forest Service, the Powerhouse Science Center, which is where we would be tonight if, uh, if we uh, were able to, um, Scott Brewing, the 232 Cohesive Strategy Partnership, the Dolores Watershed Resilient Forest Collaborative, and the San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership. So thank you very much to all of our sponsors for this event. We really appreciate all of you out there. And I wanna say a big thank you at this time to my colleague, Dana Hayward, uh, who works as the Forest Teams Partnership Coordinator at Mountain Studies Institute um, for all of her work that she's put into this event and for fielding the Facebook questions tonight and making this a really smooth and, and uh, so thank you so much, Dana. And again, my name is Emily Swindell. I work with Mountain Studies Institute and we all appreciate you joining us this evening for our virtual three-part forest and fire learning series. Uh, if you would like to rewatch or reference any of these videos, they will be available here on our Facebook page. You can also find these videos on the Mountain Studies Institute YouTube channel uh, or go to our website at mountainstudies.org. So thank you, thank you again all so very much for, uh, for tuning in this evening and we hope that all of you stay healthy and happy and safe out there. Good night, take care.